Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, it's fun when a movie does one thing and then it goes somewhere completely different that you never expected. <laughs> In more of a wild way, I would say, but... Uh, much like that, if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you're in the seats with once more. As always, uh, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals, and we pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more in a light and conversational fashion. And, you know, between you and me, if you like how we do things around here, subscribe to the podcast. We'd really appreciate it. You can uh, you can find it on Apple, Spotify, Amazon, Google, it's all good. And plus, we archive every single one of our episodes over at our In the Seats YouTube channel, so you can give us a like and subscribe there as well. We'd really appreciate it. Uh, also, find us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at either at In the Seats or at It's Podcast One for all sorts of updates. And finally, and I say this a lot, but it's true, most importantly, pay us a visit over at In the Seats, in the seats.ca for all the latest and greatest from the world of the moving image at large. If it's film, if it's television, it doesn't matter. If we're writing about it and talking about it, we love it when you come and read about it. So please stop on by. Boy, oh boy, on this episode, we got a good one. We're talking about the new film, The Beta Test, which is on video on demand platforms now across Canada. And we had the distinct pleasure of talking with the uh, writers, directors, and stars of the film, Jim Cummings and P.J. McCabe. It is a, it is a really bent, bent story about a, a married Hollywood agent who receives a mysterious letter for an anonymous sexual encounter and becomes ensnared in this sinister world of lying and fidelity and, well, anything else that you can think of or that you can think of people are doing with our data these days. It's a real commentary on uh, social media and the digital age and, and and so much more that's going on in the world today. And if you don't know Jim and PJ, they've done films like Thunder Road, they've done The Wolf of Snow, Snow Hollow, but this sort of takes it to another level because it's, it's bent and it's fun bent. And you're, you're really going to get wrapped up into it from minute one because uh, this lead guy that Jim Cummings plays, he's not all that likable, but you can't look away from the train wreck that is his experience. And it's it's a hell of a film to watch, and I cannot recommend it enough. But like I said, we had the chance to talk, sit down and talk with Jim and PJ about the origins of the film, uh, how they got it made, sort of operating outside the studio system in Hollywood, and so very much more. It was a, it was a fun talk. So check out the beta test on video on demand platforms and enjoy our talk with Jim and PJ because I know that I did. Well, I mean, obviously, congratulations on the film. I'll be blunt, man. It's more fucked up even than I thought it was going to be, man. I absolutely <laughs> loved it. Good, man. Thank you. That's Fuck great yeah. to hear. Walk me through sort of the origin of the story. Like, where did this sort of, where did this birth from? <laughs> um, it came about with just the letter service idea. So we thought about that kind of like digital temptation that you get through Instagram, um, but manifesting it in an analog space. So like getting a letter in the mail, inviting you to a no strings attached sexual encounter right. uh, that would be blindfolded and kind of like, creating this heist situation like it would be a perfect getaway like even in the most anonymatized system um it would still be a bad idea so it was kind of this cautionary tale that pj and i were laughing about and then we spent about six months thinking about that and the character was always an agent and then we wrote this like 58 page draft of it and sent it to our screenwriting buddies who are far more competent than we are and they said what's going on with this agent stuff this stuff is so much more interesting and then we had to like do, you know, three or four more months of research about what it was like to work at an agency. And then that became uh, the movie. That's yeah. what, that's all, all kind of starting from like, yeah, the idea of temptation and uh, yeah, and lying and cheating. Yeah, so and then of course it has cheating. to be at a talent agency. Right. Well, and I mean, I think that's the thing that struck me and just especially with your character, Jim, because I mean, obviously, I mean, even the line at the beginning, like, oh, we're not like, you're not like you see an entourage, we're different. But I mean, this guy was such a fragile douchebag. I mean, where, oh, did, yeah. where did you and then, find him? 
immediately after that line, I go, uh, you know, I think there's, you know, we're not as uh, as petty or angry as you see on television. Right. I think a lot of that film industry left with Harvey and then somebody comes in and interrupts me and I go, what the fuck is this person? And like immediately I become petty and angry. Uh, it's one of my favorite moments in the movie. Um, I don't know. I think like it's an amalgamation of a bunch of different people. Um, the characters based on all of this research that we did about the agency world and how these people act and how these people speak. Um, Peach and I have been in Hollywood for 10 years now, longer, 11 years, something like that. Um, so we've had these meetings with these people. And um, I don't know, it's just kind of this big, I guess, blender of um, of, of a person. And we, you know, we just, it was just like kind of this douchey, funny guy to play. And it was making PJ and me laugh. Yeah, kind of a summary of every general meeting we've ever had. <laughs> Just uh, wrapped up in this guy, this empty suit floating through an unsexy version of Hollywood, which is sadly probably more realistic than some of the more glamorous. Much more movies, realistic. Like a yeah. La La Land or something. <laughs> it's it's the anti-La La Land. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that, that, I think that kind of dovetails into my next point, because, I mean, as much as it's a film that is making commentary about, you know, sort of social media and how we live and all that kind of stuff, it almost feels like the warning that you should be handing to people as they get off the bus in Hollywood going, okay, watch this. And then, it, then if you still want to go, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was built into the DNA. We really wanted to make something that would be um, important for the next generation of filmmakers. So uh, literally if they ever heard any of these turns of phrase, like I'm excited, let's keep talking. Let's circle back. Like all of that double speak bullshit that maybe they wouldn't say out loud that it reminded them of the beta test, but that they would remember this is what we were warning them against. Um, hopefully the film acts as this kind of vaccine, this like inoculation to that bullshit where it will be harder to fuck over independent filmmakers because these people will have an inside glance as to what it's actually like. It's it's so, I love that it, the film is getting classified as a horror movie when, because it is, but <laughs> it's again, it's it's so hard to describe, like for, for both of you, when you were putting this together, like what was the tone? Was it comedy? Was it scary was it sort of thrilling like i'm trying to figure out where you guys finally managed to like sort of land the uh, tone wise because i think you found like sort of the perfect intersection of everything cool, cool. me yeah. too yeah yeah i think it was originally when we first were kind of writing the bones of the script it was more giallo i mean it was kind of we were trying to go in for like giallo yeah. 70s italian slasher ridiculous because those movies are so fun. They're so stylized and 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 like crazy with their horror aspects and all the crazy colors. And so the that was definitely music. Kind of the start of yeah. it. Yeah, big, crazy music. Um, and then, yeah, and then it kind of evolved into more of this comedic detective engine to drive the story. And we were kind of off and running from there. But yeah, right. it was more horror, I think, in the beginning. Like the first draft was kind of more horror. But there's not, yeah. it's really just the opening scene is really the only like slasher giallo. And then it kind yeah. of evolves from there in this funny way. But yeah, I'm it's funny. We're like, we do this very graphic murder that's like worse than any, you know, Dario Argento or David Fincher scene. Yeah. Uh, and then it gets to my stupid face and it's like, oh, this is a comedy now? Like, what the fuck is going on? Um, but no, I guess like throughout our movies, comedy just has to be in it. Like, there's just, if you don't make jokes throughout your movies, your audiences will. And PJ and I are both like funny people, we like to think. And so like, <laughs> we would never make a serious movie. I don't think it would be very good if we just focused on the thriller elements. Like it has to have that narrative engine that feels like Zodiac, like a detective right. story or Chinatown. But then it's so much more fun to have it be these stupid people. And um, I feel like it makes the audience feel more powerful than the powerful but in watching it and thinking this guy's a fucking idiot um it, it brings the power back to the people in a in a really important way yeah and just not taking yourself so seriously i feel like you lose audiences a lot of times that way where if like i don't know i feel like it, you want to yeah. let audiences in on the joke of this and and let them have fun with it and i guess that's kind of my character is kind of connected to the audience where the whole time i'm just like dude this is nuts like wait what are you doing like wait so you got a letter and you did what in this climate like all right man like it's that and that's kind of what the audience is thinking through a lot of the weird stuff that he has to go through i don't know that's funny now i mean for for both of you for as filmmakers as storytellers is it been this sort of collision of genres that has always sort of appealed to you both because i mean obviously there's elements of it in wolf 
Yep. But I mean, here, I definitely think you've turned it up several notches. Yeah. I think like, I feel like Thunder Road is like Manchester by the sea or like the story of Job as a comedy. Um, and it, that was working for us where it was like to watch this guy go through, you're like, oh, this poor fucking guy. But then yeah. it's also very funny. It's kind of like a slapstick Alberto Sordi movie or something. Yeah. Um, and then Wolf of Snow Hollow felt like, you know, a David Fincher movie as a comedy, um, detective story, monster movie with jokes in it. I guess a hot fuzz is probably close to it. And then with this one, we wanted it to feel sleek and austere like a David Fincher movie. And then also have the freedom of going into the Terrence Malick mode in the woods and um, yeah, just make something crafted that, I guess like Ruben Osland is probably the closest thing where it's like yeah. very austere, but very funny. Um, yeah, those are, those are kind of our biggest, but, but like Parasite does the same thing. Parasite is this like horror, romance, poignant, Thing about wealth inequality but it's very funny throughout no you're absolutely right you're absolutely right and i mean i'm kind of curious from both your perspectives as hollywood veterans you've been in the town for 10 years is it getting easier or harder to sell stories like this because i mean if i can imagine if you read the the, tr the treatment on paper it could read very differently than what maybe ended up on screen dude we never even tried we raised the funds through a website like we raised the funds through the public this crowd equity platform called WeFunder. Um, if we had tried to get this film greenlit, it would have taken 10 years, a huge waste happened. of time, and it never would have yeah, happened. People wouldn't have allowed us to make fun of them. So I don't know if it's getting easier. We like have to function entirely outside of the system because of the landscape right now. Yeah, I don't know. It's getting. I mean, we have other projects in various stages of development that just keep not. I mean, it's. Yeah, not, I guess we'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> we have to keep making movies like this on the side. That have been our most successful stuff because like Hollywood just takes too fucking long and like we just can't keep sitting around waiting for something to happen. And that was kind of the impetus of doing this. And we're doing well on our own. Like we were able to raise the funds entirely on our own without any, you know, Hollywood involvement. And then we were able to finish the film in this garage. I edited it for 16 months. We did the 5.1 surround sound mix in here. We colored it in here. We delivered it to IFC, <laughs> our distributors, so, like literally you are a functional studio nowadays because the technology is there. So I don't know, man. I think like be, because we are these creeps in a basement, <laughs> we feel like we're the bad guy at the end of, we're, we're Johnny PayPal at the end yeah. of the beta test. And, um, and I think everybody's going to start moving that way because the cat's out of the bag. No, I mean, I absolutely agree with you. And I mean, it just, it changes the dynamics so much because again, like you said, you don't need the structure of a studio to go get a film sold. You can make it, like you said, in your garage and do it yourself or sell it to a streamer or sell it to who knows where. And I mean, for you guys, because I mean, I've always heard the adage of like, you know, the you know, for musicians, what, what do you spend on the first big check that you get? You spend it on gear. Is that becoming true of filmmakers now? Of the first time, maybe you find a way to get make some money. Do you just reinvest in yourself? I mean really like the stuff is true but um but with the gear like it costs so little to rent a super nice camera these days that it doesn't make sense to own one it makes sense to rent one for 14 days like we shoot movies in no time at all so like it, you know I'm, I'm very rarely buying gear and i'm very rarely buying software that's expensive like we use adobe premiere and adobe creative cloud because i like the, i know the i know the programs and so right. like it's kind of, we don't go with expensive vendors. We're never buying huge amounts of gear. And when we do, we return it because, you know, Guitar Center has a 45 day return policy, which means that we can mix our movie in 44 days and save money for the investors. I feel like we should stop saying this in interviews in case <laughs> someone finds out and like, and we can't do this. I feel like we're getting way too loose with that, but it was incredibly helpful. So yeah, yeah. Uh, hope we can keep doing that. No, but I mean, it speaks to just sort of how hot, sort of the movie business is becoming very much the Wild West and just how people have to sort of pull up their bootstraps and get it done themselves. And I'm kind of curious for both of you, like thinking back to the younger days, like was there a movie or a moment in your life that was sort of the pivot point that made you go, fuck, I want to do this. I got to I got to make movies. I got to be a storyteller. My club. Fight Club in the Matrix, um, basically like 1999. 1999 yeah. happened and that was that was the thing where I was like, oh, this would be very cool to make movies that are this cool. I, man, there's there's so many. I, I feel like 
just relevant to this who framed Roger Rabbit and a lot of like those kind of movies. Like I just saw something like that and that would like talk about a blending of genres and just like such a cool new way of storytelling. I saw a movie and I was like, man, that was just fun and still dark and just blending so many awesome characters and elements that I was like, man, I want to, I want to tell weird stories like that on, on a bigger and bigger scale. And that's what I hope we can continue to do. That was fun. Yeah. What, what do you think it, at the end of the day helps you rise to the top and get stuff sold? Is it character? Is it just being weird? Is it trying <laughs> new things or is it a sort of a mishmash of everything? Um, there's a quote from Clarence Thomas, uh, the Supreme Court justice, who said, um, I don't know what pornography is, but I know it when I see it. And I feel like that's the same way with quality filmmaking, where like an audience gets it. Same thing with music of like, yeah. um, you kind of have to have good taste. Taste is a currency these days. And if you can have an education in what makes an audience laugh or cry or jump or gasp and fuse those together um, effectively and execute, um, that is the strength that you have like that it's it's very rarely one certain thing uh comedy has been helpful to make an audience actually laugh out loud has been a helpful contributor to to getting people to to take us seriously but um for the most part it's just watching thousands of movies that are celebrated around the world every year and um and stealing their ideas <laughs> yeah i mean you could definitely take any aspect of beta test or anything else we're writing and i think we just have gotten good at blending a lot of different yeah. people's stuff, but, uh, and kind of using that to make our own voice, which I hope we can continue to do. Are, are there ever moments in the process where you guys sort of surprise each other? I mean, there's a thousand of them. Like there are moments where in the writing process where um, we'll have this idea for a scene that's clever and then we'll realize what we can do with it and to have each other just like grab, we'll grab each other. Like, that's so dope. That is yeah. so cool. And like, like, Oh my God. Yeah. And like, it kind of creates these, I mean, those are the things you live for in the writer's room of like, Oh my God, that's going to work. That's so brilliant. And like, we're constantly thinking as though we are the first audience member watching the film. And so like, um, it becomes that you have to pass those litmus tests of like the chemistry of the scene, the alchemy of the thing and like, and imagining being in a dark room watching it with the crowd and how you can get them to be impressed. Uh, but like, that's the writing, that's the hard work. And so there's a thousand moments like that in the writer's room where we just get so stoked and have to go walk around the block for yeah, you know, 20 like, minutes. Let's take a walk. That's it. That's what it is. That's how we connect, connect act two to three and get us through the middle there. Yeah, that's those are the best parts of this entire process. It's my favorite. And it for sucks. Sure. It's hard yeah. to do that. It, like, it's, it's hard. It, it takes you, time. Yeah. It takes forever. It takes forever. Yeah. But when you get it, you're like, yes, we have it. We have the movie right there. Let's go write it. Okay. We don't suck. We, figure, we don't <laughs> suck. We figured it out. This is going to be fun. All right. Let's yeah, go you can't it. force a mic drop moment. They just have to happen. Yeah. You got to yeah. earn them. Yeah. And then sometimes it happens in the middle of the night where you like think about the thing and you go to the, like the notes app on your iPhone and you're like do voice yeah. detection. You're like, oh, I can do this. And then, and then you call PJ in the morning. And you're like, what about this? This could be yeah. me. It's the same thing. It's like, yeah. it, it's just how long these things take to be any good. Um, but luckily for us, I mean, we've made three feature films, arguably four over the last five years. And um, it, people are always like, how are you doing it? How do you do that? It's like, we're, we're usually faster than most people. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I feel like part of our problem is we have 15 different scripts we're writing and projects we're developing at one time. So we just yeah. spread ourselves too thin instead of, but, uh, but that's good. We have a lot in the pipeline that we could be working on. But you yeah. know what, boys, keep the, uh, keep the genius going, keep throwing shit against the wall, see what sticks because <laughs> I mean, I've been following your stuff from day one. And I mean, I think this film's absolutely genius and I fucking loved it. And just, <laughs> Thank you so much for the time, guys. This was a lot of fun. And Ed, congratulations again on the film, man. I think it's going to get a real following. I oh, hope yeah. so. Thank you so much, David, man. Yeah, it was great talking you so to you. Much. Great talking really to you guys. It. And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental or purchasing needs this summer as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and Blu-ray needs.